Do not adjust your tracking. You are now listening to the VHS Saturday podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome to another episode of VHS Saturday, the show where we discuss the strange and unusual odd and obscure VHS tapes that we obtained through thrift, gift, and grift. My name is Henry. And I'm Allison. And this week, we are looking at a movie called Jane Doe, also known as the the baby pictures of Jane Doe? Yes. Where did we get this tape? Well, Allison. funny story. My mom, uh, she's a dumpster diver. As a hobby. <laughs> Yes, thank you for that distinction. Uh, yeah, my mom is a dumpster diver as a hobby, not out of necessity. Uh, <laughs> she's doing good, okay? It's just for she's, done, she's very well off, and that's I think that's what makes it more interesting. It's like I'm really well off. I can just buy whatever I want, but uh, <laughs> I'm more well, interested in these <laughs> dumpster treasures. <laughs> which I mean, it's the, yeah, treasure hunting esque. It's like uh, yeah, yeah. It's I like when it. we go to like uh, the thrift store, especially the Goodwill outlet, where you're like literally sifting through fucking yeah. bins of literally. Yeah, and trash. you know what? She finds cool stuff. She does. She's new some stuff too. Stuff. Anyways, um, so I told my mom about the podcast and she was like, hey, I find VHS tapes in the dumpsters all the time. If I find any that look interesting, you want me to send them to you? I was like, yeah, that'd be great. Well, as you know, my birthday was recently and uh, she sent me a package in the mail. You know, lots of snacks like a car, normal stuff. But there was also a VHS tape in there, which happened to be this very tape, which our copy is called Jane Doe. And it is listed as a 92 minute romantic thriller from 1999, which won an uh, uh, the award for best feature film at the New York Film and Video Festival the year of its release. Seems promising, right? Um, I have not heard of anyone involved in this project except for the leading actress who plays Jane, um, Kalista Flockhart, who you might also know as Single Female Lawyer. Single Female Lawyer, fighting for her client, wearing sexy mini skirts and being self-reliant. Single Female Lawyer, having lots of sex. Allie McNeil. <laughs> Allie McNeil. <laughs> Where is McNeil? <laughs> we want to see McNeil. <laughs> I don't know how good my uh, my impression there is. It's pretty good. Is it? Yeah. And also, this is one of those tapes, which, like, we see this at thrift stores all the time, that it's, like, it's still sealed in the plastic wrap, but except the bottom, so you can still get the tape out. Right. Because <laughs> this came from a Blockbuster. Yeah, it's a Blockbuster tape. I think that's actually probably a formal rental thing. We could, we could ask uh, Jared or John. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if that's what they did at Blockbuster. Oh, you know what? This has a, a sticker on it. Previewed six ninety nine. I think that it was like it was opened and then they decided to sell it. So they like rewrapped it. Yeah. So because a lot of the times we see people like a lot of video stores and stuff putting the stickers directly on the case. And that drives me crazy. It's like, I want to be able to read everything on here, but I can't if there's fucking stickers on it. And they're old, so they're not coming off. But uh, anyways, so we decided, hey, this seems obscure. You can't find a lot of info about it online. Um, This might be worth a look. So we popped it in the VCR and the experience that we had was... For lack of a better word, it was just emotionally charged. Yeah, so this is actually our second time recording this episode because when we tried recording immediately after watching the movie, we were just very angry. This movie movie really just got underneath our skin for a variety of reasons, both the production of it, because when we pulled the tape out of the box, we saw that somebody had tapped out after about 15, 20 minutes. (laughs) Yeah. And we said, hey, let's see what was happening in the movie before they stopped and then threw it in the trash because that's what, <laughs> that's we, what uh, happened. And uh, they made about 20 minutes in um, and we saw where it was. We rewinded it. That's how we verified it was 20 minutes because that's what my VCR said. It rewinded 20 minutes, probably about five to 10 minutes of that, though, was previews of other terrible films by this random ass uh, 
Uni- Apex. Unipix films. Uh, they're the guys who put out uh, Jack Frost and Jack Frost 2, yeah. which are fun slashers, but everything else is probably trashed by them. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. So I wanted to tap out after five. Yeah. He, it was like five minutes. Henry pauses the movie. He's like, I don't think I can do this. And I was like, okay, so here's the thing. <laughs> Whoever the last person was that watched this before they threw it in the dumpster, they made it like 20 minutes. So let's at least get to the 20 minute mark and then we can assess, like, was it worth throwing in the dumpster? And I can say that at the 20 minute mark, like, yes, it absolutely was worth throwing in the dumpster. But the crazy thing is, is that kind of the the information surrounding this movie is pretty fascinating i think it's a really interesting topic right more than the movie itself so that's what we ended up doing we, we paused for five minutes and we decided you know what while i take a breather from this movie because calissa flockhart was absolutely unbearable in unbearable this. and that's not a dig at her because the next year she won a fucking golden globe for ally mcbeal yes which yeah, so she's a you know i see people talking about this performance online and some people really like it and some people are like this isn't right it's very over the top yeah which i'm in that camp i think it was awful i absolutely hated every second she was on screen hated it let's get into the plot let's well we'll we can like speed run the plot because honestly like it's It's pretty bare fucking bones yeah so opening starts out with a montage of shots of Atlantic City. And we assume that they wanted to do Vegas, but they couldn't afford it. In this montage, we see a specific building repeated multiple times. Then we figured it was because they were very low on budget and had to minimize the amount of B-roll that they were shooting. We get our opening dialogue from our narrator slash main character, Horace, saying, when I was three, I got hit by a truck and he starts talking about how since then he has been obsessed with the concept of chaos and he even states that you may not think it because i was three but i knew that chaos was the life for me or whatever and it's like you're fucking three years old of course chaos (laughs) of course that's what you're all about what else do you know you knock everything over you're like fuck yeah yeah three years old you have no concept of order yeah so right off the bat we're like okay this this sucks (laughs) but go on (laughs) this man is obsessed with the cause of not aging outside of being three years old Honestly, that explains <laughs> a lot. that explains a lot so much. Yeah, so he's going to work, and he works at this uh, quote unquote transvestite bar. Which, uh, you know, folks, it was a different time, okay? It was the 90s. Nowadays, we would refer to it as a drag bar. Or even just a gay bar. Yeah. You know? Uh, but, yeah, he works at this quote-unquote transvestite bar. This, this this bar is one of ten jobs he's had this month. Yeah, he can't hold down a job because he's just, he's a writer and he can't be a part of this system. He wants to be this... Uh, You can't hold me down. I won't work for the man. But really, it just comes off that you don't have any real skill and you are unemployable. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And so we see him at work where he's a bartender. And uh, I don't know. They're trying to portray that his job is difficult because the drag queens are very picky about which which pickled eggs he gets out of the jar for them. (laughs) It's such a hard thing for him to do. He's like, no, no. Oh, he can't figure that. That's what I'm saying. He has no skill. He can't even get a fucking pickled (laughs) egg out of the jar. Right. It's it's not that the drag queens are demanding. It's that this job isn't very hard. You still can't fucking do it. Yeah. I'm just saying like 10 jobs in a month. Yeah. Okay, so. On average, you had two jobs per week. One week, you had three. I just, I don't know, man. How does he afford a studio bedroom in New York City without a stable income? I don't know. All movies were like that back then, you know? Like, it was always, like, people 
lived in these like big houses or something. We're like, oh, I got to find a job or the landlord's going to kick us out. And it's like, how are you living in this fucking house oh, or apartment? Oh, or have you ever looked up how much it costs like for the friends apartments in New York City? <laughs> no. It's like, oh, it's, it's absolutely insane how much an apartment that size would have costed in like 1995. I was going to bring up friends that that was like a prime example that it's like, OK, yeah. so you're just like. Like, You're uh, broke, but you live here. Yeah, okay. Like uh, Joey's like an out of work actor, mm-hmm. and like he lives with uh, Ch- uh, the Chandler. But Chandler, like, they they actually talk about the movie. He in the show, he pays for all of it because he's friends with him. But uh, like, still like uh, Phoebe is just a. Is uh, she like a waitress or something? She, no, she's a musician. Oh, Rachel's a waitress, right? Oh, 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 we got a waitress, a musician, and then what did Courtney Cox's character do? I don't even. I never watched that show. I don't even remember what she did. I don't like that show at all. I don't like, like friends. The three of them, they can't... That's a huge-ass apartment. Adjusted for inflation, Monica and Rachel's apartment and friends in the size and neighborhood they live in would cost between seven to $8,000 a month. Anyway. Yeah. Anyways, so... so close to Flockhart. Yeah, she, she, comes she comes in. She's trying to light a cigarette, and she can't light it, so she goes inside the bar. She sits down at the bar. She's wearing sunglasses inside. And uh, she's like... Who do I got to fuck to get a cream soda around here? She's That's got this like kind of like transatlantic accent. Yeah. It's 1940s transatlantic. But uh, specifically, that, that's a quote, like the whole cream soda bit. That's what she actually asks for. Yes. And then she starts talking about alcoholic drinks and we get our main characters looking at her like dumbfounded. He gives her a beer. He gives her like a can of Budweiser with a straw in it. Oh, because she asks. She says she can't drink it without a straw. Oh, yeah. She's... Oh, my that's, God. That's because she's so quirky. We're in for... Uh, just right off the bat, folks, let me tell you. This is a Manic Pixie Dream Girl story. Yeah. It's self-insert, masturbatory guy being like, this is what my perfect GF would be like movie. And it's very cringe. But, uh, you know... <laughs> She asks for drinks, then she settles on a beer Mm -hmm. with a straw. He gives it to her after just staring at her like an idiot. And then we just cut to them fucking. Yeah, well, first she explains to the drag queen why she has a black eye. Right, because one drag queen has like a cut on her eye or on her face. And she's like, oh, that'll be better in like three days. She's like, like, how do you know? And she pulls down her sunglasses and she's like, I fell into uh, a mailbox. mailbox. Yeah. Classic. And, yeah. As soon as I she saw that, before she said mailbox, I said, oh, she's going to say she hit, she walked a, a door doorknob. Yeah. And but. then it just like very abruptly cuts to them fucking in his apartment. Which, uh, this just dawned me as we talk about this. That seems kind of predatory. Dude, they didn't even have like any rapport. They had no back and forth with each other. She was talking at him incessantly in the annoying way that she does throughout the whole movie. Mm hmm. Like very, very 1940s noir, like every everything like, I, you know, if she just talked like that in the bar, I would be like, OK, she was putting on an act. But no, that's how she acts throughout the entire fucking film. Yeah. And uh, then after they fuck for some reason, like uh, she finds out that his real name is Horace and he was going he has a pen name and he's a writer for a magazine, which she calls a rag. Again, going back to this, like, 1940s yeah. slang. <laughs> oh, I read that rag! Yeah. Oh, that's a terrible transatlantic accent I just did, <laughs> but still, it's like, like, oh, and then she finds out who he is, and, oh, because she went to the bathroom. Yeah, she, she went to the bathroom and took the magazine with her, and then she's like, oh, you read this magazine, too? He's like, I write for it. Yeah, she's she, like, oh, really? She was like, she's like, you have a lot of issues of, uh, Herpaderp magazine <laughs> and he's like oh yeah I write for her she's like really he says what his pen name is and she's like what that's not what you said your name was at the bar last night and he's like it's a pen name and then she like just starts like literally doing like saying she worships him like Wayne's World style like bowing in front of him quite literally she's yeah. bowing down yeah with the we're not worthy <laughs> we're not worthy uh, then they decide to go on a date after they had fucked. Yeah. Kind of backwards. They do a really good job. Uh, I'm being super sarcastic here. They do a really good job displaying their uh, their chemistry together, which they have none. But, you know, we're supposed to interpret it that they do and be charmed by it. They uh, They go to Chinatown. 
Uh-huh. That's a their date. And then we see this like filmed in this like artsy 15 frames a second kind of like a, a light streak kind of way, which is a reoccurring trend in here in this movie. Yeah. Um, it reminds me actually of uh, Chongqing Express, but that's a good film. I never saw that. It's a, it's good. It's Chinese mm. Hong Kong film. But uh, yeah, so they go to Chinatown. They go to a Thai shop. Yeah, it's like a clothing store. They have like jewelry and clothes and stuff in there. Yeah, and, it's, and he's looking at ties and uh, he's like, this is so expensive. I swear someone down the street, some street vendor was selling this tie for like five bucks. And she goes, well, this one's real, not a knockoff. It's pure silk, blah, 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 blah. And then... Uh, so she, like, pretends to kiss him. And while she's, like, up against him, she takes, like, a handful of these ties and just shoves them in his pants. And, you know, if he was a morally good person, perhaps he would have been like, hey, you know, this is our first date. And I'm very put off by the fact that not only are you shoplifting, but you're using me to shoplift and yeah. roping me into this crime. Uh no, um, he just goes along with her fucking scheme. He's obsessed with chaos. Yeah. And so she fucking pulls this stunt where, like, on the way out, she pretends to trip and fall and knock over a clothing rack. And then the people in the store are like, oh, my God, are you OK? And she's like, yeah, I just hope it didn't hurt the baby and, like, pretending to be pregnant so she can get out of there. And so... Um, They give her I don't know if like they were going to buy this initially or if the employees gave it to her as like a consolation gift for getting hurt. But like they give them this little like toy duck, toy duck or like chicken or something. Robot duck chicken thing. Yeah, Yeah. I think it's a chicken. And it's like one where you like you wind it up and it just kind of like spins around and flaps its wings. And like makes like quacks. It looks like a chicken, but it quacks like a duck. (laughs) like an old saying is it yeah <laughs> look like a chicken but you quack like a duck it's or that, no it's a fucking quote from cool cat saves the kids <laughs> yeah you're, you're quoting like, cool cat like that's an <laughs> old saying it's just fucking daring savage <laughs> He's like, um, what, like, what a scholar, David. <laughs> Very savvy. He's like, I don't even remember what he says. He's like, something, you look like a cat, but you stink like a dog. <laughs> wow. You look like a chicken, but you quack like a dog. <laughs> That's a phrase Butch it is bully. now. <laughs> so then they leave this, uh, this, this local business. Yeah, that they just stole from. And right outside the oh oh before they go in there, uh, there's like because it's in Chinatown, she starts just like bowing to everybody, like very like blatant, like stereotypical bowing. These are people that are walking around to, uh, on the street, and I have a firm feeling those were not extras. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Throughout they fun- this movie, there's a couple times where we're going to see some, like, boomer-ass racism where, like, they probably didn't think it was that big of a deal. But, like, watching it now, we're just kind of like, that was unnecessary. That kind of had some, uh, you know, like, sus underlying it's, motivations. It's like they go, they go to Chinatown because it's, like, you know exotic you know it's like oh it's like a it's like a fanciful thing where it's so foreign that's how come we're just gonna start bowing to fucking everybody on the goddamn street that they just you know i live like what 10 minutes away from like international district here like Mm -hmm. you know those are just people going getting groceries and shit yeah like the other people going up to that tie shop you're like well i got a new tie for work you gotta go get a tie for my job but no she's just like bowing to them anyway that just weirded me out so they leave this this building and they just start laughing as they pull these ties out of his crotch now he's got crotch ties and uh yeah literally like on the fucking steps of the business they just looted like laughing like ha 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 we just stole from this mom and pop business. we just stole from a local business lol it's like what but, you know, they, they don't have jobs. They're unemployable. So it's yeah, you know, and, and it's supposed so, to be quirky. You're supposed to be like, oh, you rebels. But really, it's like you guys are just. And so right away, like, I don't like either of these yeah, characters. No, for sure. And so when you're setting up this kind of like 
romance story that's supposed to be universal. Uh, really, like, a romance is based around the characters and their relationship. Like, you want to relate to that. But I don't relate to it. I I really, I really don't vibe with anything that they do or I'll, say. After, you know, you, you bring up something very, very good about the uh, plot, about being universal. And uh, here's what the writer had to say about writing this movie, about wanting to be universal. The way to break through into the consciousness of people is to take a personal story and turn it into the universal. That process of transmutation is called writing. When what resonates for you personally resonates for someone in the darkness of the theater, you're on the right path. That is a true statement, but your movie was not written that way. We will see how this does not correlate to what his intention was. Clearly, he came up very short. Yeah, we will get way into that. (laughs) So, So after their shoplifting date, uh, he asks her to move in. Yeah. I don't... Because he finds out she's homeless. Yeah. Look, I don't care how much you love chaos. If you are a bartender at a transgender bar and a straight woman walks in with a black eye and asks for a beer with a straw and then you take her out after fucking her, that's one thing, okay? You know, you're just... You're, Live your best life, sweetie. <laughs> you're, you're kind of a scummy person for taking advantage of someone that's clearly in a bad situation. Yeah. To, but then, after she takes you shoplifting, you go, you know what? You should move into my 15 foot by 15 foot studio apartment. Yeah. Um... Just bad decisions from everyone throughout the whole movie. And it just keeps going. So it's just like a this movie is like watching a fucking pebble roll down a hill and just get like bigger and bigger until it's like a boulder. Yeah. Of just like, what the of fuck? Just bullshit. Yeah. Uh, so then we get to the part where there's like a, a bit where they, she's obviously moved in and established herself into this uh, apartment in their life. I don't know how long of a time span this is supposed to have been. Could be a week, could be a month. I don't, I don't I, know. It's, it's hard. To, they don't have anything clear, especially because you can't see a, this apartment really transform as she takes it over because it's like a studio. <laughs> There's yeah, she like unpacks some of her stuff, but she doesn't have a lot of stuff because yeah. she's homeless. So it's like she puts out like what, like a mirror and a teddy bear and maybe like some clothes. She no, she 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 carried had she had a hand mirror because some later Rudy goes, you should get a mirror. And oh, that's what they see. We see her install a mirror. Fucking Rudy. So, should we just talk about him while we're at it? He's yeah. only in the movie for, for two like seeds. five seconds. Two seeds. Yeah. Yeah. So Rudy's his neighbor. So at one point after she's moved in. uh and must have still been fairly freak recent to her moving in because Rudy is being is up all night and he's like having like a party of some sort. Yeah. And so the walls are super thin. So, you know, they hear everything and they're trying to sleep and they can't sleep because Rudy's being loud as fuck. And then they're talking about how Rudy, um, they could smell his weird cooking and the things that are weird are beef brain, beef tongue and tripe. And Calista Flockhart's character says, I thought tripe was a fish. And he's like, no, it's cow stomach. And he says it like it's so disgusting. He literally calls his neighbor a man of culture, but in like this sneering kind of way where he's like, Ugh, he's a man of culture, just like everyone else in this godforsaken apartment or whatever. It's like, like you, you live in New York, the melting pot of the fucking country, and you're just going to be upset that other people don't just eat cheeseburgers, you know? Yeah, it was like, this is again what I'm talking about with this like subtle kind of like racist it's, undertones it's, it's, in it's, this movie. I, it's more ignorance. It's more of like, right, right, it's, right. It's just like. They're different from me. Yeah, like when I think of like boomer racism, I don't necessarily think of like overt like hatred racism. I think of more just like yeah, just like I was saying about like Calista Flockhart, whether she's just battling everyone in Chinatown because yeah. it's just like this like it's a uh, it's a fanciful world there, and like whoa, it's so different, and like that's so strange to me as someone that just like you know grew up going to Chinatown for groceries, mm-hmm. you know. That's like, yeah. she's like, I don't think those are actors. You're just bowing to people. They're like, what the fuck is this white girl doing? I'm just trying to go to uh, this noodle shop up the street because they were right in front of like a fucking noodle shop. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Anyway, so that's Rudy. Uh, the, Apparently that actor was drunk on set. He's a, he's a guy that killed Freddo in Godfather 2. Yeah. We actually had to watch a scene from Godfather 2 uh, the other day in my communication class. Really? Yeah, we had to talk about the subtleties, the, the nonverbal body language that both characters were exhibiting during this discussion in the mm. movie. Um, so anyway. Uh, yeah, this guy was apparently drunk off his ass. And as soon as we saw him on screen, we're like, is that the drunk guy? Because yeah. he sounded drunk. Yeah. <laughs> they had to rewrite his lines because they only had three takes per shot because of the amount of film that they had to shoot. on. Yeah. Uh, because of the very limited budget for this movie. Uh, the next scene he's in was the one where he could not get it straight because Rudy is in the apartment with Calista Flockhart when our main character, Horace, comes home one day. And they're just... Yeah, they're just, like, hanging out together. And I'm like, dude, I'd be a little sus. Yeah, your girlfriend's talking to your weird neighbor. He's standing on your bed with, with his shoes, shoes on. on. Everyone in this movie... Oh, my God. I think I talked about this in a previous <laughs> episode, but, like, one of my biggest pet peeves in TV and movies is when, like, people are in bed with their shoes on. It just drives me fucking oh, yeah. insane. That it's well, like, we talked about it in Magic Bubble. Yes. But to be fair, he was, he passed out waiting for her. I guess. But it's just like, hang your feet off the bed. <laughs> what are you doing? Like, I, I think in Magic Bubble, he did. Like, like his, his no. I think he might have like moved around onto the bed, but I don't think he like, it was like, time to sleep in I this. can't, I cannot justify it under any circumstances. <laughs> you do not put your fucking feet on the bed with no, your shoes I, on. I agree, especially like somebody else's bed and you're just standing. They were both like just standing on it. Because that's where he has all his own articles. Up. That's how pretentious he is. He pins up his own fucking articles yeah. onto his wall. And like, I have written for magazines and I have the issues of the things I've written. And they're just in my nightstand. They're not pinned up on my fucking walls. I don't want to read my own writing. Well, he also has his like amateur photography up on the wall as well, which like we'll see through their relationship. They bond through like her modeling for his photography. But like the type oh, yeah, that's of, how the date started, actually. Yeah. And the type of pictures that he's really into taking are like her being dead. Yeah. And I'm like red flags all around, <laughs> like from both of these people. I, I got a bit of a ginger snap vibes from that. Have you seen that movie? No. Oh, that's good. She wants to go see her dad for his birthday. Yeah. And she stops the taxi to see Charlie. Charlie, the, tr drug, the drug dealer. dealer. She's like, oh, we got to stop right here. Stop right here. Charlie's there. I got to talk to Charlie. And they're like, what the fuck? So then she goes and we see this again, this weird like blurry montage of her laughing with this guy. That would weird me out. Your new girlfriend, we're going to go see your dad, stops the car to see this guy, and they're just like giggling together. They're like holding each other. Do you remember that? Yeah, they were like hugging. And they're like in this weird embrace. Imagine being a horse going, what the, what the fuck? Yeah, even the cab driver brings it up because then like she and the drug dealer go around the corner into an alley and like the fucking cab driver's like, you trust that guy? Like... You know, and I was like, yeah, like my thoughts exactly. Like, what the fuck do you not? Yeah. So, <laughs> like, you know, it's a little concerning. You don't want to be like, oh, let me come with you or something. Yeah, that know. made no sense. And then we find out that she gives him money. They take pills. She gives him money. He freaks out at her and kicks her in the stomach. Yeah. And then she comes back to the car. And he was like, what the fuck was that about? And she's like, oh, you know, it's for my migraines. I told you about my migraines. And she starts like bumping and scratching her head like a tweaker, mm -hmm. you know. The pill that she took was Placidil. So they take Placidil, which is sedative and hypnotic soporific medication. So it's used to um, help with insomnia. So... It's like a sleeping pill, basically a sedative, but she's acting like she's on meth or crack or something like she's tweaking. Speaking of tweaking. So then we get to the dad. It's his birthday. She gives him his present and she did the asshole thing where you wrap it up in a million fucking layers. Yeah. Which is one thing, you know, yeah, it can be funny, but she's yelling at him to hurry up. Why is it taking so long? And it doesn't feel like a playful kind of like. Hurry up. Ho ho. I, I wrapped it up in a million layers. She legitimately seemed like she was mad. That it was taking so long. She's it, like, come on, hurry up. Hurry up. Let's go. Let's go. She's super high energy. It's like it, nonstop. It, and you're just like, shut the fuck up. 
Yeah, it's like, like, dude, if you want me to hurry up, don't put in a million fucking layers. Turns out to be like this crab with a brass crab for his her dad's brass collection. You open up the crab's torso and it's an ashtray. And uh, you noticed another crab in the movie. Yeah, on in Horace's apartment, we didn't mention all of the weird shit going on in his apartment, but like he has a ventriloquist dummy and a whole ass crab on top of his CRT TV. Like it, it's like I don't know if it's a like fake or what. It's not alive, but it's just like a big giant life size like king crab, and he just has it. On top of his his TV, why I don't know. But then we he's have quirky. but then we have the scene with the brass crab, and I'm like getting flashbacks to Magic Bubble when we had all that like rabbit imagery. Yep. And we're like, is this supposed to be symbolism? What's up with that? And so we're like, is the are they trying to go with the symbolism with the crab thing here? I don't know. Does, they does, never does the writer have crabs? <laughs> <laughs> is he crabby? <laughs> 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 I don't know, dude. She's crabby. Yeah, because she can't get her drugs. So then she passes out. Maybe that's when the medication actually kicked in. I guess. So but like, she, she, damn, that's a long time. They like went through dinner and everything. <laughs> but like, the so pills really take that it's long. A, it's a timed release. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So. Well, I don't think uh, our writer knows very much about drugs. We'll get to why later uh but so then the dad's like are you guys serious and he's like well, i don't know why and he gives the backstory to jane doe explaining how she got after her mom died right her mom died her mom died when she was four and then the dad says on her 18th birthday she got twenty thousand dollars from a trust from the trust fund from the trust fund of her mom's passing, and then she disappeared for a whole month. And when she came back, she was uh, he said she looked like a pincushion because of all of the needle holes in her arms, and that she'd obviously been doing heroin. And then she mentions that like she's addicted and she can't stop. And so there was a while when he was helping her like with her addiction. And like enabling her, essentially. And then it got to a point where he couldn't deal with it anymore. So then he kicked her out of the house. And that was just recently, apparently. Now, $20,000 in a month is a lot of money. Yes. And that's a lot of money on heroin, which is a cheap drug. Yeah, like the whole thing with the opioid crisis going on now is that people turn to heroin when their prescriptions run out because it's cheaper than Mm -hmm. the pills. It's cheaper and stronger, but that's why it's more dangerous because it's cheap and strong. Right. And uh, this is movie. This movie takes place in the 80s. Mm -hmm. So that's twenty thousand dollars in 1980s money. Right. $20,000 in 1983 is worth $53,625.30 today. That's a lot of fucking heroin. Yeah, dude. That's a lot of fucking heroin. Not only is that a lot of heroin, but that's a lot of heroin in one month. Yes. One month? And we didn't get any kind of, like, lead up. Like, oh, she, uh... Had a troubled past as a teenager after her mom passed away. No, it's like mom died at four, 18 heroin. Like there's no explanation. Yeah, like she wasn't a problem child before that. Like she didn't like get mixed up with drugs as a teenager. She wasn't like, you know, she started off drinking and then got into harder stuff that it was just like. And then you get $20,000. That makes sense. Like, but okay, no. time to do heroin. Like, I don't. Okay. <laughs> Whatever. So anyway. So. Then we see the scene where we find out where she lives, which is a warehouse. With is that the like abandoned house thing with all the graffiti on it? And yeah, stuff? it's like this weird, like broken down half. I'm gonna call it a halfway house because it's a half. Because it's, it's halfway built. It's, it's halfway built. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. It's literally like a like when you see they're building a house somewhere and it's like halfway built and they say like hey don't don't go in there like you know all those like gi joe psas and stuff about not like fucking around in those houses because they're dangerous yep it's like they're just living in one yeah so she had been squatting with her russian hispanic friend 
Lucinda. I think Lucinda's like Russian or Ukrainian or something. She's at least that's the accent she's trying to do. But the name is Hispanic. Yeah, I don't know, man. And hey, uh, it's New York. It's a melting pot. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's that's fair. I'm Asian with a uh, Scottish name. Maybe her real name is Lucindova. <laughs> and she just goes by Lucinda to make it easier for people. Oh, maybe Lucinda is just a street name. Maybe. Her real name is Olga. And like, <laughs> I don't know. It's like, yeah, no one wants to sleep with Olga. Like, you gotta have a sexier name like that. You gotta go by Lucinda. Then we just get like a, a whole lot of montages of uh, her going on like benders. She just disappears a lot. And uh, she can't get a job. And we find that she had a job as a camera girl and she got fired after smoking on a job. Now, I don't know what a camera girl was in the 1980s. Yeah. Not to be confused with the cam girl, which the uh, the writer Wrote made a, his most recent film was actually about cam girls. And uh, yeah, we'll we'll get into that later when we discuss Paul Bedito a little more. Yeah. But uh, yeah, <laughs> if you know what a cam girl did in the 1980s, please let us know. Yeah. Because and like why I was thinking like maybe a model. Yeah. Like you're a girl who's on camera, like you're a model. But like, why would a model get in trouble for smoking a cigarette on the job that like, didn't everyone smoke cigarettes in the 1980s? Yeah. Yeah, Like, especially because smoking indoors was allowed in the 1980s. I feel like somebody would have been like, hey, Joe, Jane, hey, Jane, you can't do that. Uh, Step outside. Yeah, or like... Or do you need to take a break? Yeah, or like only on your smoke break or something. But no, like people used to just like smoke while they did everything all the time back then. Yeah, all the fucking time. And like just no one gave a shit. The only people that didn't were doctors, but that was still like a fairly recent thing. Yeah. So I... I don't know what a cam girl did in 1980, and the internet is no use for obvious reasons. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're like, huh, cam girl, what is that? And like, <laughs> cam girl, 1980s, like, how do you even search for that? And then it's just all this, you know, like, fucking porn websites and shit. I'm like, okay, there's no. And we can't even do, like, you know, do thing with subtract porn in, in, <laughs> in the search engine because what if that's what it was? And then we will still get nowhere. Honestly, this movie is not SEO optimized at all because the fact that it's called Jane Doe, like, you Google Jane Doe. And of course, you just get all of these like crime articles. But then you're like, OK, all right. Jane Doe, 1999. And then they're like, Jane Doe from 1999, body found or something, you know. And then it's like, OK, Jane Doe movie. And then apparently there's another movie called like the biography of Jane Doe. And then there's another movie called like. Did we mention this movie has another title? The Baby Pictures of Jane Doe? Yeah. Sometimes which is also equally terrible. Yeah, sometimes it's referred to as that. Sometimes it's just Jane Doe. The box that we have is just Jane Doe. That doesn't make any sense. The Baby Pictures of Jane Doe. No, they show her baby pictures in like one scene. Yeah, with the dad, right? Um, I think it's like she was at the apartment and she hung up some of her baby pictures in the apartment. And there was a scene where she was like looking at them reflecting on her childhood. And I think we're supposed to interpret this as she feels. Uh, like uh, upset at how she's turned out. I guess. Or something. I don't know. I don't. Really, no. It wasn't significant enough to title the movie after it. No, no. So then she prostitutes, right? Yeah, they don't really, like, show too much of that, though. Yeah, they gloss over the fact that she started, like, being a prostitute. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, at the same time, you know, we find out later that her parents have been giving her money. Yes. This whole time still. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, That's why she's able to just like not have a job and live her life as a quirky manic pixie dream girl who just whimsically meanders through life. Then he finds her drugs. Yeah, I think because she's been off on benders so much that she just doesn't come home or contact him for days that he starts getting like, I don't know, uh, concerned. So he starts like going through her stuff. He comes home one day and she's like, Literally face down the floor with her face in a bowl of food. 
in like a bowl of soup. It was like she was eating soup on the floor. And she's like passed out. Yeah. Uh, I guess that seems more like a heroin thing to do. Yes. That's a that's a heroin. Yeah, movie. that was probably like the most accurate yeah. portrayal of heroin <laughs> yeah. in use of the movie. Yeah. yeah. So he finds in a uh, doll that she had a bag of heroin and needles. Yeah, I think we've been saying teddy bear, but I think it was a baby it, doll. It was a doll. Yeah. yeah, it was a doll. Yeah, yeah, yeah last night on our first take, we, I call it teddy bear. Mm. Yeah, it was definitely, I remember that was a human doll. Yeah, and he like pulled the head off and she was like stashing her drugs inside the, the she, doll. She says it's not hers and he gets mad at her still. He's like, oh, is it just someone you're holding it for? And he reacts totally out of line by like... <laughs> He swipes everything off the table into the ag- wall ag- against the wall and starts like yelling at her. And I'm like, this is no way to confront someone about a drug addiction. Yeah. Like, like you obviously she's going through some shit and like you're just going to get mad at her and she's upset with him for going through her shit, mm-hmm. which is, you know, look, no addict acts well when confronted with their problem. You know, like she is acting, you know, she's like, fuck you. And she's saying mean things and she's being aggressive. And I get that. I mean, at least her excuse is that she has a drug problem. But like, what's Horace's excuse? Yeah, nothing. He's just an asshole. Mm hmm. So then she tries to storm out the department and he grabs her and like just grapples her Mm -hmm. and throws her onto the bed after like holding her down. And, and then, like, won't let her yeah, go. Yeah, won't let her go. And then he gets up, he grabs a suitcase, and he just starts throwing random clothes into there. I thought he was packing for her. Yeah, I thought he was packing up her shit, like, kicking her out. Which I was like, yeah. You know? Like, if you're not gonna be supportive, you should just send her on her way. But then, apparently, he was gonna go leave. Yeah. And I don't know what the game plan with that is. Like... Your drug addict girlfriend with no job that disappears on benders. Here's you alone in my apartment with all my other stuff. I'm going to go <laughs> take a break someplace. Well, he must not have had anything valuable she could <laughs> steal. <laughs> Did she already steal those, like, CRT TV with the, the crab? <laughs> <laughs> like, that crab's worth at least, like, $23 a pound. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> So then she she has a total like uh, manic moment where she swaps her uh, her personality. She starts getting sad and crying. Mm-hmm. Begs him not to leave. And then they decide that they need to get out of New York. But we don't see them have this discussion. Literally, we see them in the fight. He's packing a suitcase with no explanation if it's for him or for her. But then he picks up the suitcase. He stands in the doorway. And then he goes to leave. And then it's like, like literally the next scene. Like we, we They're get, getting a new apartment. We get like a dialogue. We get a narration of, yeah. from, from uh, Horace going, we decided the next best thing to do was for us to both get out of New York. And they went to Atlantic City in New Jersey. I don't know if that was a good idea. I don't think New Jersey is very much a... Uh, a place that much more different from New York. If you're trying to get away from from <laughs> it's drugs, it's a perfect getaway. <laughs> we need to get away from the shady life of of heroin for you, Atlantic City. <laughs> <laughs> we got to get you away from all this drugs and depravity. I know just the place, New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> New Jersey, Atlantic City. I'm gonna go be a craps dealer. <laughs> we'll get our life together, baby. So. Then uh, they moved to a one bedroom apartment from a Russian guy. So it's, it's a step up. It's no longer a studio. Yeah, they at least have like rooms and a table now. But it, so it, she doesn't have to eat soup on the floor <laughs> anymore. <laughs> okay. Now when she falls asleep while eating soup, she's in a sitting position. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I have to keep reminding myself that it's like this could be based on real events. And so it's like, I look, I don't want to laugh at like someone's real suffering and their real problem. But I just feel like this movie doesn't portray it realistically at all. So I have trouble connecting to it realistically. We're we're not laughing at the real events. We're laughing at this piss poor depiction of real events. Yes. Um, 
So then she still can't hold down a job. Uh, so she says the domestic life was perfect for her. Which, he says that. Yeah. Because he his perfect GF would just want to stay home and cook him fucking skeddies all day. Oh, yeah. She says, I cook skeddy. Yeah. And it's, uh, let's be honest, like, as much as I like spaghetti, it's not a hard fucking meal to make. No. That's why I like making it, because it's not a hard <laughs> fucking meal to make. But it's just like, it just bothers me, this, like, really, like, childish attitude that she has, and that, like, I don't know, it's just sort of this thing that we see in Manic Pixie Dream Girl stories that, for whatever reason, like, the men who write these masturbatory fantasies, like, the women are always acting like children yeah and i'm like that's kind of creepy just a bit just an, that's just very creepy like she never like aged out of like you know yeah yeah and we had that problem with the magic bubble too oh yeah that when was she was weird. like acting like a fucking eight-year-old you know to be in the magic bubbles offense there was a magic bubble involved yeah right <laughs> like, what's her excuse Magic Bubble Girl, she had her shit together and then she was wished that she was younger. Yeah. And the Magic Bubble's like, mm, no age. Yeah. But this is just like, she just acts like that. Because even like, I mean, okay, so we're supposed to believe she's a heroin addict, right? Like, she does heroin and it gets her in bad situations. Sure. But the majority of the movie, she's not on drugs. The majority of the time, she's just acting like herself, which is this like high energy, manic, childish person. Or are we supposed to assume that's what a person on heroin acts like? Yeah. Or or do we have a skewed perception of how we're supposed to view this movie because we know how a heroin addict would act like? Yeah. And so it's kind of confusing because we did see that the director said that he didn't think she portrayed a heroin addict well. And so, I mean, (laughs) I think personally, as a director, I might try to direct my actress to act more that way, (laughs) because that's the point I'm trying to get across. If if this is based on a true story of the director's ex-girlfriend who Mm -hmm. passed away of a heroin overdose, so you saw firsthand that how a heroin addict acts, and this girl is supposed to be portraying their, and you're directing her, and you're going, you know, she's not acting like a heroin addict. Your job is to tell her how to do that. Right. So, you know, he has these blogs on his website where he's whining and crying about how the movie didn't turn out how he wanted. And it's like, bro, you were the fucking you were the writer and the director. If the dialogue was trash, that's on you. And if the execution was trash, that's on you, especially if the actress in question went on the next year to win a Golden Globe. Yeah. That means it's not, it's not her acting ability. Yeah. Because no one gets that good at acting in a year. It's you, bro. <laughs> so... So she becomes domesticated, but she still looks for work and she finds a part time under the counter job for six dollars an hour, which I guess in 1980s, that's actually pretty good. Yeah. When she said for six dollars, he was like, hey, like that's actually (laughs) celebrating. That that sounds like nothing now, but that's that was pretty good in 1980s money because my first part time job in 2006 was for seven something an hour. Yeah. So, yeah, for sure. That's why it's going to the counter. So she's going to pay taxes either. Mm -hmm. Whoa, more (laughs) chaos. Yeah. (laughs) So he meets uh, another Italian guy. Everyone in this movie is Italian. Yeah. Uh, He meets some other Italian New Jersey guy at the bus bus stop. Which is also a terribly framed shot. I was like, are they watching a movie? Like, it looked like a movie. It was really bad. There's like, like, what's going on? There's the it was a shot from behind, and like part of the bus stop was like a T bar and it was like cut off at the bottom. And it looked like the movie became more letterboxed, but it was just they the terribly framed shot. And this guy says, I'm a craps teacher. I teach people how to be a craps dealer at all the Atlantic City casinos. Yeah, and he hands him a business card. Then the guy's like, I'll tell you one thing, though. Fuck this bus. And he, like, walks away. And it's like... <laughs> it's like... He's just trying to get people to sign up for his crafts class, you know? Right. He doesn't really take the bus. He sees this guy. He's like, this guy looks like he doesn't have a job and he's down on his luck. <laughs> he's at the bus stop. He probably needs a job. <laughs> <laughs> Here's my business card. Yeah. Come learn how to, you know, be a crafts dealer. 
So when he becomes a crap stealer, she gets a job at the cheesesteak store. That's what they the call cheese it. Cheesesteak factory. <laughs> <laughs> we call it the cheesesteak factory, but they literally call it the cheesesteak store in the movie. It's and like, I'm sorry, but like the cheesesteak factory sounds so much better. It just sounds like the right thing to say. It reminds me of both the the re- real restaurant, the cheesecake factory, but yes. also Freddy got fingered when he's working at the cheese sandwich factory. Yeah. <laughs> but the cheesesteak store, that sounds wrong. I don't know how you're supposed to explain what a cheesesteak restaurant, that even sounds wrong. Cheesesteak restaurant, cheesesteak shop, cheesesteak cafe. These all sound weird. Yeah. Cheesesteak like, store still sounds really fucking Because that implies that you're like, you're going to, like, you're purchasing like a prepackaged cheesesteak. Right. Steak yeah. It's, it's like. Or cheesesteak making ingredients and then bringing it home. Right. The cheesesteak store sounds like you go and like, you go on a shelf and you grab, like, oh, this one's on rye. You buy cheesesteak and cheesesteak accessories. <laughs> 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 like, so, she, so her dumbass cuts her hand open. Yeah, she's chopping lettuce and just like cuts off part of her thumb. She's the, uh, you know, they only had like one head of lettuce because they show her chopping this lettuce very, very fast, but she's not even like moving the lettuce. Calista Flockers is like slapping his knife up and down on the cutting board. We're supposed to like get the idea that she's she's trying, but she's just not very good at it. Well, like the the guy, the Italian guy she's working for is like, she's an excellent worker. I don't want to see her out of here for too long. You know, so we get this this implication that, you know, she's good at the cheesesteak store, but she's dumb and cuts her hand open. Mm -hmm. And so then uh, she goes to the hospital and i guess they got more fights over something like i don't know she went on more benders or what the fuck was going on because uh nowhere lucinda shows up he walks into his house one day and lucinda's there she's just sitting at the fucking table with uh cocaine at uh on a mirror yeah and she's like oh this isn't for don't worry this isn't for uh jane this is for me Mm -hmm. and he starts talking about how he's angry with her for coming. Well, yeah, because like she says, oh, Jane says I can stay here for a few days. And, like Jane just invites her junkie friend to come stay in their new apartment without even asking. After them. they've been trying to get away from that life. Yeah. And um, somehow that leads into them fucking. Yeah, because Lucinda's a fucking trifling hoe. And so she's like. Oh, yeah, I just get off on fucking people, especially if it's high risk, like someone could just walk in right now. And he's just like, well, Jane could just walk in right now. High risk in the 1980s, but someone's got AIDS. Oh, my God. I mean, well, hey, if they're fucking sharing needles. Right. That's that's what I'm thinking. Like, she does heroin. Mm -hmm. I die high risk. She's homeless. Yeah, dude. He loves chaos. Oh, and apparently. okay, so apparently Jane's been gone a lot. And even when she is around, they're not having sex. Exactly. So their relationship is just kind of taking a nosedive. And And, so. And that's not explained anywhere. It goes from them being happy and her getting her job at the cheesesteak store. Then him like, you know, nursing her with her cut open hand to like, oh, we've been having troubles. Yeah. The movie is just kind of like one minute it's fine. And then one minute it's really bad. And it's just kind of like switching off constantly. So then uh, after they finish fucking, because they couldn't get their pants on quickly enough, uh, Calissa Flockhart walks in Mm -hmm. and she gets angry at them, obviously, for obvious reasons. Yeah. Like, like what would have happened if they just uh, had their pants on? Like, that was very convenient timing. Like, you know? Yeah. So they get into like an argument, all the three of them. And uh, it's a very heated argument. And Jane Doe grabs a knife and she stabs Horace. Yeah, stabs him in the back of the shoulder. Mm -hmm. And Lucinda gets spooked and she gets out of there. As one would do. Yeah, she she doesn't come back. Smartest character in the movie. (laughs) Yeah, but then the next scene is like them talking about how they went to the hospital and the doctor said everything was fine. So Jane is sitting there literally like putting band-aids on his fucking stab wound. And they're just like, 
they're totally okay with it, that it was just like a little oopsie doodle. Like, it's like, oh, it was in the heat of the moment. It was an impassioned yeah. kind of thing. And it's like, oh, uh, bro, you just got stabbed. Well, to be not fair, you slept with my junkie friends. Yeah. I stab you. We're equal now, this right? It's a very like abusive relationship on both ends. I just think that like Horace seems like the shittier person because at least Jane has a drug problem. Yeah. And she's struggling with that. And Horace is just like being a fucking dick in response. His mom died. Her mom died. Then she became a drug addict. His parents are paying his bills. We are not the same. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> like He's just an asshole. And during one of these montages of things, there's a lot of like montages, just like shit fucking happening. Mm-hmm. And it's just all of this pointless, meaningless shit. At one point, we see Horace standing with the, that chicken duck that they stole from the Chinese people. Like, and he's like at this weird like turnpike. He's like in the middle of the road uh, on like an island divider, just like flapping his arms up and down. And we see it for like a brief second. And that's like, I guess, foreshadowing for what's going to come up in the next couple scenes. Then Calissa Flockhart gets a job Mm -hmm. selling uh, sunglasses to tourists on the boardwalk in Atlantic City. Yeah. And apparently she's good at it. And it's going well, and she survived, like, a whole ass day. So, of course, since the bar is low, they decide this is an opportunity for celebration. So they go for margaritas, and then she jokes about, you know, don't do this and this again, or I'll stab you, lo, 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 lo. Yeah, like, she's holding up the knife, like, joking about stabbing him, and I'm like, bitch, are you serious Yeah, it's right like, now? whoa, 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 are you... The fuck? Like, yeah, what the hell? Why are we playing like, this off as, like, normal? Like, if... If I forgave you for stabbing me in the heat a moment after I fucked your friend, that's one thing. <laughs> Don't make jokes about it later and threaten me for lols. Yeah. That's... No. Then I would just... You know, unless he's threatened to, like, fuck more of her friends. I'll go fuck Charlie next. Uh, <laughs> we're so close to wrapping up this fucking stupid plot. So I'm just gonna skip right to the end and so she goes to see her dad again and she's supposed to stay with him for like what a couple weeks or something like that a month i don't know just to go see her dad she missed her dad for something yeah so she goes there and then he hasn't heard from her in a while and then the dad is like hey uh she's in the hospital she got into drugs again so he goes or he goes out there to the hospital to see her she's in the hospital bed and then shortly after she passes away and then the movie ends with him with the toy duck thing on the island divider on the road. It's like circling and quacking and he's just like imitating it by doing this chicken dance and laughing about it because yeah. she would do that every once in a while, like in these like random ass montages. And so we're supposed to be seeing this come full circle. He's like remembering her by doing the chicken dance yeah so we'll post a clip of that on our instagram because i feel it's something you have to see for yourself just how first of all like out of context i think that seems hilarious <laughs> it is it is but like in context it's just really cringe and annoying it's like my girlfriend's dad bah, 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 bah. Yeah, right like what the fuck because she was like doing that earlier in the movie and we were supposed to think it was cute and quirky and i don't know I so it's fucking dumb i i hated this movie I really we're going to get into the thing that I find the most interesting, and that's talking about the director and writer, Paul Pedito. Yes, we could go on for a really long time, but we'll try to be brief that basically this was his first and last directing job. He started off writing for theater and then this was like the first feature length movie that he wrote and got uh, distributed. And he has a personal website where he's written many blogs about the uh, production production of this film, um, thoughts he has on it and the story behind it. And um, overall, he's kind of regretful of how it turned out. Um, There's a lot of things that he didn't really like, but simultaneously, 
he's proud of this film, depending on where you're looking at on the Internet. Yeah. Like he boasts about how this movie won an award at uh, the New York International Independent Film Video Festival of 1999. It won Best Feature. And he also brags about how it's critically acclaimed and we could only find <laughs> one negative review from a critic about it. <laughs> yeah, and so possibly one other review. Is a, can you still consider a movie critically acclaimed if the only potentially positive critic review no longer exists anywhere? And she wrote it on a blog about apples. Some like it's okay, so company. if you look, if you try to find critic reviews of this movie, the only ones we could find on the entire internet were on the IMDb page. There were two critic reviews. One was from the AV Club, in which they absolutely panned it and called it words like awful. <laughs> um, and then the other review actually pulls up a 404 error on some like. Apple Orchard Company in British Columbia. Yeah, not far from us, but... Right. Yeah. And so, like, you can't even find that review anywhere. Yeah. It doesn't exist online anymore. Even with the Wayback Machine, it was never, it never got archived. Yeah. So... And we, it has no, like, not even any reviews on, like, Rotten Tomatoes from critics or anything. So, I... I don't know if somebody was like, hey, Paul, that was a pretty good movie. Like, at the fucking uh, festival. <laughs> Critically acclaimed. <laughs> <laughs> or like, because this woman is not a critic, really. She. No, she's just a writer. I guess she does like um, she has a profile on IMDb and you can see all of her reviews of like every other movie. But for whatever reason, like this one isn't around still. And so I Probably don't know. Probably because if... it was posted out of fucking apple orchard website out yeah. of all the places that's not a publication so random it's so weird and i mean there are positive um reviews just from people and i mean I, i'm sure those people were paid but <laughs> the paul Pedito paid them because his parents paid for so much of this yeah so like we fell down the rabbit hole on his website reading all of his blogs and he's talking about like how to get your independent film off the ground and whatever and he talks about how literally okay his dad works with movies his mom owns a costume shop his brother who starred in this movie owns a theater all in the chicago area where he's from and his parents lent him $90,000 and the play that this movie was based off of was shown at his brother's theater. So it's like, I mean, honestly, I'm going to say it like privilege all the way around. Like, and especially if we think about that, this movie is based off of his life where you just got to meander through living in New York as a fucking freelance writer. Like, I'm sure you weren't making enough money really to get by completely on your own. Yeah. Right. So his parents were giving him money. Mm -hmm. Her parents were giving her money. Yeah. And then when he wants to make a movie about her life, his parents just gave him more money. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. And so I think that's the only reason why anyone even knows that this movie exists. I think the biggest piece of the pie is that. They got Callista Flockhart and then she blew up like a year later. Right. Because this movie was made in 1996. It wrapped in after one month of filming and it wrapped in June 2nd, 1996 and it was released three years later, mm -hmm. June 15th, 1999. And between those times, because I did tell you right now, it doesn't take three years to edit a fucking movie. Um, in 1997, Callista Flockhart blew up with Ally McBeal. Yeah. And then in like 97, 98, she won that Golden Globe. Mm -hmm. This studio must have been sitting on this movie and they didn't put it out because they knew it was fucking gutter trash. And then when she blew up, they're like, we can milk this cow without having to pay her a dime. <laughs> well, Paul says that he didn't see any of the money that this movie made. He said that it made about two million dollars and he didn't get a cut of that at all. But he has been teaching screenwriting at USC in Chicago for almost 20 years. 
And so this is really, really hilarious. But when we were looking at reviews on Letterboxd, we ended up finding pretty good mix of good and bad reviews. But there was one in particular that stood out to us. It was a two and a half star review from someone who said, my professor wrote this. And so we did a little Google foo and we found this person's um, email address. So on a whim, we sent out an email. She got back us pretty fucking fast. Yeah. So thank you so much for your quick reply, CJ. Um, CJ had a lot of really interesting things to say. So we're going to share that with you. Um, We said we asked, um, would you be willing to let us in on a little more information? What Mr. Petito was like as a person and as a professor, maybe more in depth what you thought about the movie or his works in general. And CJ gave us a very lengthy reply where basically she says that um, she believes that he's a good professor and that he helped her make her writing better. But a lot of the time we see people who teach certain subjects maybe aren't the best at execution. And then we have a phrase, a turn of phrase in the lexicon for that. Those who can't teach Mm -hmm. it's a very common trope yeah and uh so she says um as a first-time director many of the directions weren't seamless and led to a lot of awkward back and forth between the crew shooting days running into each other and overall tension from him directing his brother led to the mess the film turned out to be Paul himself called it not great in class and encouraged us not to watch it only fueling my desire to see it of course Um, overall, he was a really great screenwriting teacher without the writing credits, a super funny guy that definitely took some getting used to, but his quirks always made class interesting. It's strange how the best screenwriting teachers often haven't written a blockbuster hit, or that might just be my experience. Having your work flop teaches you how to be more critical of all writing in the future, I assume. So I think that Paul had very good intentions making this movie. And maybe in context in 1999, it was less obnoxious. I mean, we had movies like Reality Bites about this same kind of, uh, you know, I don't want to be part of your system type whimsical attitude. I mean, Manic Pixie Dream Girl shit, we weren't sick of it yet. So I don't know. Maybe it was better back then. But all I know is watching it now, it was so obnoxious and pretentious and unbearable. I hated this movie. I hated yeah, it. It literally made me angry yesterday. Yeah. This is a this is our couple times we're trying to record this episode. Yeah. Because <laughs> we had to try this a few times because the first time we tried talking about it, we were very emotionally charged and kind of angry and aggressive. Yeah. <laughs> I good thing I deleted everything we recorded that we said. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, We were just like, I mean, I don't know. I think that Paul is probably a good guy. Luckily, he never directed anything again. He still writes, though. And his most recent writing credit was actually for a movie called Chat that came out in 2015. We didn't have very much time um, between, like, lunch and recording this show, so... You know, in between, we decided to look up the movie and watch a little bit of it and just kind of see what it was about. And uh, again, the writing was pretty fucking atrocious. Yeah, it's it's bad. It's pretty bad. The dialogue is terrible. Yeah, I think like uh, we mentioned earlier, it's about cam girls and it's basically a like a mystery of some kind. Where like this guy is missing and he's trying to find his daughter. Who? Yeah. And so like her dad is trying to find her or whatever. And so, like, he finds this other cam girl to help him out. And uh, when he meets her, she's on cam and she has this line that stood out to me that I just thought was so bad. She says, like, I fuck all the sex monsters. (laughs) And I'm just like, what? What? It's like Paul has never actually interacted with a cam girl. He just knows of the concept. (laughs) I think he's that guy who, like, he has, like, a free... He has, like, a basic account, and he just sits in rooms and, like, never talks or tips. And he just sits there and watches 
for like, and he has a basic account for like 10 years and he just never, ever purchases any fucking credits. I can see that happening. Yeah. I could definitely get that vibe. Mm hmm. I don't think uh, back of this movie, because I'm still just thinking about what the fuck is a cam girl 1980 fucking doing. That is really interesting. Like, that's that, the like, phrase he used. Yeah. Just, like, they use they say cam girl. And like, what the fuck was that? Yeah. What 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 is that? Yeah. I want to say it's like it's like a model or like a girl who is on camera for some reason. Was, but uh, I don't know. I, I don't know. He says this movie was meant to honor his girlfriend. Yeah. I don't know if putting all her dirty laundry on blast is the uh, appropriate way to honor somebody as much as it is to just, you know, try to make a buck. Yeah, I think that, like I said, I feel this is coming from a good place, but the execution is so poor that think of uh, think of the show Intervention and how uncomfortable it is to watch actual drug addicts struggle with that Mm. and you know they definitely speak with the family and see the struggles that they experience dealing with their loved ones addictions and like i don't think that's something that's hard to portray or pull off i don't think it's a concept that hasn't been done before like i think especially as a guy who's so about writing screenplays by the book that like he couldn't find more interesting or creative ways to resonate with the audience. I feel that this probably made a lot of sense to him and was very sentimental to him, but like to us with no connection to these people personally, we're just like, right. That's why I was saying earlier with his whole entire concept of, Oh, you know, I knew I was going in the right direction because what I write resonates with other people, even though it's a personal story. I'm like, no, dude, you, you didn't. You fucked this up. It doesn't resonate with me. This feels very self-serving. It really does. Yeah. Like, like I said, it doesn't feel like you're honoring your past girlfriend. Like it, it feels very self-serving. Yeah. And we mentioned, you know, the term like masturbatory, that it's almost masturbatory in nature and that like this manic pixie dream girl fantasy fulfillment sense and that's just like really fucking cringe. That's like my perfect GF would cook me skeddies and do heroin and do the chicken dance <laughs> and make my boring ass fucking life more interesting yeah. by injecting it with her heroin? chaos. <laughs> oh my god, inject okay. Injecting was a bad word choice. <laughs> oh my god, I'm sorry. I don't think he knows what heroin does. I don't think Paul's very familiar with drugs based off his blog about this movie. When he finds out he hired a stoner for a lawyer. Oh, no. And his verbiage about his stoner lawyer who had the uh, the best buttage. The dangerous buttage. In all, a, caps, all caps. Buttage. Uh, and then he says. Purple Intica, I believe. <laughs> and it's like. What? He had that dangerous purple intica buttage. Intica. <laughs> so heroin's an upper purple intica. <laughs> uh, what that a, a sedative makes you fucking hyper. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I I want to give him the benefit of the doubt and be like, okay, he probably just like changed some things or exaggerated some things in the movie to make it seem more relatable or universal and like he just ended up doing the opposite on accident (laughs) but i mean it's also possible that he just doesn't know it reminds me like think about it reminds me of all the other times we see weed portrayed in various movies where it's like that's not how it works at all yeah i think media's gotten better about that they definitely have yeah like we have movies like uh fucking like pineapple express i think was the first one that really like portrayed it in a more like yeah it's over the top but at least it's like showing people like smoking weed the way most people smoke weed and people show like weed as like a uh like almost like a hallucinogen all the yeah, time they do that with lsd i think that like the way that they portray 
like acid and mushrooms in media is just ridiculous. It's so off base. If you've never done psychedelics and somebody says they did and they said they saw purple elephants. Yeah, and they're shit. like, dude, I was in the woods and I found these gnomes and I was talking with the gnomes for like two hours. And it's like. You're you, lying. You did PCP or something. <laughs> yeah. Like, what the fuck? They, they're absolutely lying. Mm-hmm. If, uh, or they were on something completely else. Yeah. <laughs> because that's not what those do. It doesn't make you see things that aren't there. It reminds me of, like, uh, even alcohol is poorly portrayed in movies. You know when they show them she's going shot for shot, and then, like, someone takes one shot, and they immediately just pass out. <laughs> and it's like... It's like, that's not how alcohol works either. Did you ever have to do like in uh, in like driver's ed? Did you ever put on the drunk goggles? Not in driver's ed, but when I was in the military. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. When I got to my tech training, there was a bit where they're talking about don't drink and drive because, mm-hmm. you know, now we've been in training for like nine weeks. Now we're basically in a college type setting. We have our free free time after we uh, finish our classes for the day. Class ends at like 430 and then we have the most of the rest of the day to ourselves. You know, you can go play video games. You can go shopping. There's bars on base. After so many weeks, you can go off the base. Uh, I just played Call of Duty. Um, you played Call of Duty for fun while you were in the military? Yeah, man. That sounds like such an awful, like, <laughs> like, wouldn't you want to do anything other than military stuff in your free time? No, nah, because I was good at it. <laughs> bang, bang. All right. <laughs> I'm like really good at Call of Duty. Mm. And that was that was his peak call. This is this was a uh, right when Call of Duty Modern Warfare Three was coming out. Mm. Like it came out when I was in tech school. I got it at midnight, so like you know it was that prime time of like the peak of Call of Duty's popularity. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I had to put on the drunk goggles and I had to drive a little like a uh, a cart. They made you actually drive with them on? Yeah. Oh, my God. We had an obstacle course of cones. Holy shit. And you had to do the obstacle course of cones with, like, a pedal cart. Well, Mm. you know know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And uh, then he put the drunk goggles on you. And they're like, all right, now go do the course again. And the pedal cart. And, you know, of course you can't. Like... I always remember the drunk goggles being like, that's not what it's like. I was about to say that. I was about to say when I put them on, I was like, this isn't what it's like being drunk at all. That's like being like people who get that drunk, like you have a problem. Yeah. You've got to be like a 300 pound person who can drink like multiple bottles of something in a night and still keep going. Because like I cannot, I cannot get that drunk. Yeah, I don't know, like... I feel like it's more accurate to being, like, cross-faded. Like, if you're super drunk and you smoke weed, I think that it's more accurate like that. I haven't done that in years. Yeah. But, man, I stopped because, like, you know, I can't. Yeah, (laughs) it's too much. I I got fucking sick, and then, like, I tried it again. I was like, yeah, this isn't going to work. I cannot get drunk. Like, I'll drink and smoke like I fucking did last night when we were watching this fucking movie. (laughs) But, like, you know... I both are in extreme moderation. Right. I'm not going to get like plastered and then like fucking do huge rips. Like that's not going to happen. It's not a good time for anyone around me. Dude. Yeah. I just think that it's hard to accurately portray these things, but you can get close. And they're getting I, better at getting close. Yeah. Yeah. I think that especially now with like, we have an opioid epidemic in our culture now. Like we have so many people on these kinds of drugs. And so we're less disconnected from this issue more than like ever before. And so now I guess watching it, you're like, this is not accurate. This is not what this addiction looks like. And I don't think it does anyone any favors to portray it in this way. Right. Maybe because she was a, a heroin addict. That just would have been a boring movie. Yeah. She just disappears and when she's home, she's just falling asleep in soup. I guess, but like you're making a drama film. Like you can you can make that dramatic. Like I said, I've been watching a lot of Degrassi lately, okay? <laughs> it's a fucking drama show. Like Sure, it's, you know, like, teenage issues and whatever. But, like, 
the way that they can turn such minor issues into like this huge dramatic thing. Right. It's like, I know that this is possible. I'm not saying it's not possible. I'm just saying maybe it was easier if like, like if Paul listens to this because you seem like the kind of person that Googles your name. (laughs) Like (laughs) if I'm not knocking anything about his girlfriend who is nameless. We don't know his ex-girlfriend's name. Mm -hmm. So the real life Jane Doe. If the drama that happened and the trials and tribulations that happened within their relationship was from her heroin addiction and was really just her disappearing for like weeks on end and then her being just kind of aloof when she's at home because she's just, you know, fried. That doesn't make a very engaging movie. And we also don't empathize with her if she doesn't really have a personality outside of like, I do drug, I go disappear. Yeah, I think that like he there were choices to be made here thinking that like, okay, he's the writer and he's the director. If you want to tell an autobiography, then, you know, you're telling an autobiography. So I feel that like as a writer, you want to stick to the story as accurately as you can, maybe tweak some things to make it more interesting for film. And then as a director, you really need to direct your cast to portray things in the way that, like how they make you feel and make your audience feel that. But then there's like, okay, well, if your autobiography is simply just not translating well to an interesting film, then it's up to you to make creative choices that would be more interesting. So I think if he had made the story about someone who was addicted to like upper drugs, I'd be like, okay, that's a little more accurate. You know, especially they could have fixed that in post. Yeah. With a, with a voiceover, just have his brother like voice something else. Like, you Mm -hmm. know, like, because they never deliberately state it's heroin. Yeah. I don't know if they even use the word heroin. They didn't. They just had, you see needles. Yeah. That's it. And so it's like you're you the only drug that. that we get is uh, that pill. That's Yeah. Mm-hmm. So um, they, they could have definitely just fixed that in post. And like, I understand, like, based off of his blog and off of the email that we got from CJ. Again, thank you. Thank um, you, CJ. Uh, he had issues directing his brother. I can get that. I can yeah, understand that. For sure. His brother seemed very stubborn about the whole process. And while his brother wasn't the worst part of this movie... You know, that's th- so I I don't see that as being a major issue. His brother more or less came off fine. Like he's a not a great actor and everything, but like. He didn't have an issue directing Callista, but Callista wasn't matching what he wanted. Mm-hmm. So, like, what's the issue there? I think obviously Paul knows where the issue lies. And that's how come this was his only directing uh, role. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I, I'm not. I'm not speaking to Paul from the perspective of like, you should feel bad and you should get better. (laughs) I think he realizes that himself, but it's also just like, I don't know. It's very interesting to see how one second he's like regretful of it. And then one second he's like critically acclaimed award winning. I mean, okay, Paul, I'm going to let you know know this, right? I'm going to let you know a little secret. I can tell when you're embellishing things that are not there. (laughs) <laughs> it's very apparent it's very obvious everyone can see right through it it's uh, I, I, I mean whatever he's doing all right he's teaching people and uh maybe they'll go on to make something much better than this i mean you know I, maybe this is one of those things where like all those things where he was trying to play it up was when it was still potentially making money mm. and like that that's all just remnants on the internet still yeah because i don't necessarily see it on his personal blog saying it's critically acclaimed and stuff but man like looking back on all that stuff it's just like you could just tell it's embellishing if they got like one critic say yeah that was all right and like it's critically acclaimed <laughs> Which, I mean, at this point, that positive critic review is alleged. (laughs) So, like, we can't even prove that any critic has ever said anything positive about it. So. Oh, in this cut, we haven't even mentioned that garbage theater. 
I was just about to bring that up to like wrap things up. Yeah. So there is something very like beautiful and poetic that I wanted to mention. Um, so reading through his blogs, Paul talks about his start in theater. And like we mentioned, his brother owned a theater in Chicago and they would put on these small, low budget productions and Frequently, what they would do is they would dumpster dive to find things for costumes and sets and whatever. And they had kind of coined this term dumpster theater and they called their productions dumpster theater. And uh, I just think that is so beautifully ironic that this film was discovered in a dumpster in the Chicago area, no less. Yeah. That Jane Doe is dumpster theater. It's his attempt to get away from dumpster theater. And at the end of the day, that's all it ever was. He started as dumpster theater. He made a garbage film. And then that garbage film was discovered by your mother in a dumpster. Yeah. It belongs in the trash. Yeah. More like it belongs in the trash. <laughs> I was going to put like that fucking. Uh, what's it going to sound like? That? That's how I found it this morning. So, I mean, that's just. I think that's a perfect note to end on. Like, this movie. Belongs in the trash. Belongs I, in the trash. Yeah. Like, look, I know some of you people online, you like it, whatever. Uh, I don't. I think it was really bad. It was super hard to sit through. I don't want to watch it ever again. As a matter of fact, I want it to go right back in the trash where it came. Right into the trash. Mm -hmm. If it wasn't a gift from your mom, I would probably be like, let's just... Let's go take it out back and put it out of its misery. Give it the old yeller. Yeah. (laughs) But, uh, you know. Yeah. Oof. Yeah. This was tough. Like... This, we have not had such like a negative emotional reaction to a movie we've watched for this podcast so far. I have never had a reaction where I wanted to stop a movie and be like, no, I can't do this. Yeah. Because she was so unbearable in this film. And this podcast isn't about shitting on movies. Mm -mm. We don't find bad movies. We love the last several movies we've watched. Yeah. Like we, even as much as we made fun of a cartoon All Stars to the Rescue... That was still fun. Mm -hmm. You know, we love the shit out of Hands of Steel and Cocaine Wars. We trashed Magic Bubble, but like we were more questioning of what it. we were more confused than anything about Magic Bubble. (laughs) Yeah, this one was just like it's sad because you know that like it's supposed to be sentimental and it's just cringe and you're like, oh, God, like you deserve better. Like your late girlfriend like her tragic passing like deserves better than this. I just I really don't think it should have been put into a movie to honor her. Like maybe something about her past, you know? Yeah. Before I don't know. she became a drug addict. Like I wouldn't that's not how you commemorate somebody. Do you put that on a fucking tombstone? Here lies so and so, heroin addict. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Or at least, like, try to come up with some kind of um, more, like, a a bigger dichotomy between how much they love each other and how much the drugs come in the way of that. That, like, I just see... Or maybe not show the part where you throw her things at the wall. Yeah, and and slam doors and cheat on her with her friend and, like, you know... It's just not like I'm going to be honest, Paul, if you're listening to this, uh, you don't look like a very good guy. in this. Yeah, I really want to believe that, like, you didn't act like this in real life. And this is just to make drama in the movie. Yeah, because like if this is based on, you know, your actual like reactions to things, I'm like, you were not in the right here either. Yeah, I also wanted to bring up so. We watched this movie called My Demon Lover. Oh, God. A few weeks ago. Not for the podcast, but... Uh, just it was potentially to, for the podcast. Yeah. 
potentially we were like, oh, this sounds weird. And that movie is actually really similar to this one, but in like the like the roles are reversed. We, yeah, we have this uh, this hyper woman who's like a business lady of sorts. Yeah, I think she works in advertising. Mm-hmm. Uh, but she's quirky and still just getting her foot in the in the door. And she meets a hobo who literally spits food on her at a restaurant. And then she decides, like, hey, you want to fucking be my boyfriend? Well, because he rescued her. Yeah. He rescued her from something. Yeah. But then, you know, he like spits food on her and stuff like I thought that was beforehand. I don't know. She saw him beforehand and he was like some hobo. And then like uh, he was like stalking her. He wouldn't leave her alone. And then she gets attacked by something. And then he rescued her. And she wakes up the house and he offers her coffee. He's like, yeah, she's like, oh, it was you that saved me. He's like, yeah. And then she offers to him to stay the night because like, oh, you're I mean, you're homeless. You just rescued me. So I guess, you know, you can, you can stay here. There's a he's a werewolf, but instead of a werewolf, he turns to a demon. And there's like voodoo involved. Yeah. And so it's basically just like their relationship is intolerable. We couldn't even finish that movie because it was so fucking bad. And this one was like we were really close to being like, I can't take this. Yeah. But we like forced ourselves to get through it. We only force away. So we only force ourselves to get through it because of all the other shit we found out about it. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So thanks, Paul, for having a train wreck of a blog. Yeah, um, thanks, Paul. So I mean, yeah, that that movie, My Demon Lover, Lo- My Demon Lover, was just so weird. But it also, it's similar. But like I said earlier, I was like, in his defense, he's only homeless because he turns into a demon at night. <laughs> You know, he, yeah, he, that's that's the only reason he can't get his shit together, because at night he turns to a demon, goes, does demon things. Yeah, I think probably at the end of the movie, he gets his shit together. I think I don't know. I, I don't want to find movie. out. <laughs> but but yeah, yeah um, I want to say thanks to my mom for giving me this this tape. Um, <laughs> it was fucking awful. I don't want to see it ever again. I'm going to put it back in the trash. Ooh, we should save in case we ever make Calista Flockhart. Oh my god. Want to autograph this picture of you looking drugged out on this VHS slipcover? Fuck. Uh, all right. Well, I actually don't think this is streaming anywhere. No. I don't know. Um, it came up on Amazon Prime, but it said it wasn't available in our region, so maybe it's available somewhere else. It's not available in the U.S., though. If you got a VPN, figure it out and let us know. <laughs> yeah. If you want to, like, put yourself through this, I don't recommend that you do. But, you know, if you feel so inclined, uh, there's not many options out there for you, so you got to get creative. If you feel so inclined, there are much better ways to harm yourself that are oh less abusive towards your mental health yeah. than watching this film. This movie's awful. It's bad. Uh, I don't think it's actually critically acclaimed. I think it's all a lie. It won at one film festival one year. It won best feature length of out of how many feature length movies were at that film festival, yeah. which is all indie films. So maybe no one else made a movie that hit the 70 minute mark yeah. to really count. So maybe he got that as a participation trophy. <laughs> I don't know. There's some people who like this movie a lot. I think they don't have taste. This is coming from people that will watch. The Hot Chick is one of my favorite movies, dude. Like, I have low standards. I love slashers, but, you know, my thing about slashers, and you might, know, like, they're, they're objectively bad movies, but... You reduce your expectation when you're watching either a slasher or a Rob Schneider film. (laughs) Either way, you know what you're doing. It's not that we have bad taste. We we set our expectations low and that's why we can be pleased by (laughs) it. It's like if the hot chick had like a best feature New York International Independent Film and Video Festival on it. And then you're like, what the fuck? (laughs) This won an award. (laughs) It's like when you go to McDonald's, right? You're not expecting high cuisine. You're like, you know, it's it's a fast food burger. And you can say, hey, you know, that tasted pretty good. Not compared to like, you know, a nice restaurant, but for what it's costing, what your expectation is for a fast food burger you're getting in three minutes after you order it, hey... That's fine. And that's what slashers and stuff like the hot chick is provided you set your expectation appropriately. Mm -hmm. Like we do have 
high standards for film. But, you know, we do have our guilty pleasures. But, you know, it's one of those things where we're not going. No, no one is saying the hot chick is the peak of cinematic art. Right. You know, we know what we're getting into Mm -hmm. when we put in a Rob Schneider DVD. (laughs) We know what we're getting into when we watch Slashers. We had no idea what we were getting into when we watched Jane Doe. The box lied to us. It's bad. Don't watch it. Belongs in the trash. It's literally and figuratively dumpster theater. Yes. That about wraps it up for this episode. Yes. Thank you so much for listening. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you listen to podcasts. Visit our website, VHSSaturday.com. Sign up for our mailing list for all updates VHS Saturday. DM us if you want to get a sticker. They are $5 plus shipping. We will see you next week. But until then, remember, be be kind, kind, rewind. rewind.